Thank you this morning for a wonderful time of worship and we thank you for the opportunity now to press into your word that we might learn and grow and become the people you're calling us to be because your word was given to us to guide us in all truth and so we thank you today for the truth that will be imparted to us through these portions of scripture that we'll look at today and we just thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You know, I heard about this uh, nice old man that would always go to the same diner every day and he would have uh, lunch there. And he always ordered a bowl of soup. Now with the soup, you got a couple slices of bread. So the manager, you know, saw the guy was a pretty regular customer, so he went over to him and he, one day he said, how do you like your meal? And the old man said, the soup was good but I'd like a little more bread. So he said, okay. Took that into consideration. So the next day when a guy came in for lunch, he said to the waitress, uh, double up on his bread. So she gave him four slices of bread. So the manager went over after he ate and he said, how was your lunch today, sir? He says, the soup was good, but I'd like a little more bread. So the manager says the next day, listen, I don't care. Give him eight slices of bread. So he has his lunch, he eats all the bread. The manager says, sir, how was your lunch today? He says, the soup is very good here. The bread, a uh, little more would be nice. So the manager says, I can't deal with this. So he goes down the street to a bakery and they make these huge loaves of bread. They're like six foot long. He brings one back, gets a tray, cuts the loaf in half, plops it on the tray and says to the waitress, tomorrow when he comes in, this is his bread. So she brings in the bowl of soup. She brings in this tray with two huge three foot long pieces of bread on it. And he sits down and eats the whole thing. And the manager goes over and he says, sir, how was your lunch today? He says, I like the soup. But I notice you're back to two slices of bread. <laughs> so we've been talking a lot about bread, you know? We talked about the crumbs and the children's bread and Jesus is multiplying bread. Well, we're going to talk about bread some more today. So let's take a look at these verses on the video as we move into chapter 16 here. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, When evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it. Except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you have little faith. Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? 
but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So all this starts out because the Pharisees are asking Jesus for another sign. They're basically ignoring all the signs that have already been displayed that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he uses this statement to them, uh, a little saying that we still use today. It says, red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky at morning. He says, you, you recognize those, those kinds of signs, but you want one more sign. He says, well, guess what? You're going to get one more sign. It's going to be a big one. He says, you're only getting one, but it's going to be the sign of Jonah. Because just like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, Jesus is going to go in the belly of the earth for three days. And that will be the ultimate sign. That's the, the best sign anybody could have, that he's truly the Messiah. This is what he said to the uh, Pharisees back in chapter 12. He said this, they, the, Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up against this generation of the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. All of this which is pretty clear what Jesus is saying, but it's going over the heads of the Pharisees. But the thing is, it shouldn't be going over the heads of the disciples. They should be getting it, and they're not getting it either. They should have understood, because Jesus taught so often in parables, they should have understood that he wasn't talking about literal bread when he warned about the yeast of the Pharisees. He says to them, look, you, you saw me multiply enough to feed 4,000, enough to feed 5,000, and you think... This is about who forgot to bring the sandwiches? This has nothing to do with that kind of bread. This has to do with the yeast or the leaven. It's two different words the Bible uses of the Pharisees. Jesus gave the same warning in Mark 8, 15. He said, he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So why does Jesus use the example of leaven or yeast? Because it's a substance that if it gets into something, it spreads until it, it consumes the whole thing. We also see in scripture a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So one example of this leaven of the Pharisees was this insistence on seeing more signs. That's one of the examples of what was wrong with the Pharisees and their thinking. It's as if everything Jesus had done wasn't good enough yet. And the Pharisees are saying, yeah, we saw that miracle and we saw that blind guy can see now and that lame man can walk. What else you got? Give us a real sign. And Jesus said that yeast of unbelief or lack of faith can, can spread in somebody's thinking. And he's trying to warn the Pharisees, although he knows they're probably not going to listen, but he's also trying to warn his disciples because when he talks about the son of Jonah, he's basically saying to his disciples, don't miss the big sign. This is more than once I've talked about this. I'm going in the earth. And I'm coming back, like Jonah went in the fish and came back. But the amazing thing is, when Jesus dies and is buried, disciples are clueless. They don't go, they're not sitting around going, oh, right, the sign of Jonah, he'll be back. They're like, he's gone, and he's never coming back. And we need to hide, because they're going to come and kill us too. But he's trying to tell them here, don't let this th panic in your mind when I'm gone come upon you because I'm warning you about this. I'm saying, don't let the leaven of the Pharisees creep into your thinking. So you say, well, what does that really look like? What is the leaven of the Pharisees? Well, the great thing about it is Jesus gives a, a, a very specific definition of the leaven of the Pharisees in Luke 12.1. 
He says, under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There you go. You don't have to ever wonder again. But what does he mean? He means hypocrisy. Okay? So he's saying that we have to be on guard against hypocrisy, which is what? It is saying one thing and doing another thing. So how, what would a hypocrisy look like for a Christian? It's when I'm telling people I'm a believer in Jesus Christ or I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but they look at my behavior, they look at my lifestyle, they listen to the words coming out of my mouth, and they don't line up. So if the, if the person I'm claiming to be doesn't match the person I am, guess what? I've been infected with the leaven of the Pharisees. I'm no different than them because they were great at saying the right stuff. They just weren't doing it. And we as believers have been warned by Jesus, don't let that sneak into your lives because yeast spreads. And he gave this other example uh, 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 about Herod in Mark uh, 8.15. We saw that. He said, beware of the, the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, Herod wasn't a Pharisee. In fact, the, the Pharisees couldn't stand Herod because Herod was a puppet king that had been put in place by the Romans. And yet, Herod had the same yeast in him, the same hypocrisy in him that the Pharisees had. Why? Because he wanted a sign. We saw this in Luke 23, 8. It says, Now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, because Pilate sent him to Herod. For he had wanted to see him for a long time, because having heard about him, he was hoping to see some sign performed by him. How many people here have seen Jesus Christ Superstar? Okay. Funny little song that Herod sings, right? Prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool. Right? You know that line? That's what, that's what Herod's doing. It's the same thing. It's like Jesus, you know, so many times you'll hear people say, if Jesus would just show up right now and prove himself to be real, I'd believe in him. Well, he already did. Amen. Jesus is saying, I've given you enough signs. I came back from the dead. You're not getting any other signs, people. He's the Messiah. And the leaven of the Pharisees can infect all of us. And I want to show you another level of how this connects between the New Testament, is what we're reading now, and the Old Testament. I've told you before that it's important to understand the Old Testament in light of the New. It makes sense when you put it in the context of the New. So I want to go back and I want to look at where this concept of yeast or leaven come in. And we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 12. And it's talking about the establishment of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, two things in connection to each other. They can't be separated. It's the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So I'm going to read this to you. It's a long passage, 14 verses 14 through 20 of Exodus 12. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, you shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought you, your host, out of the land of Egypt. And therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day, of the month at evening you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses for whoever eats what is leavened that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel whether he is an alien or a native of the land you shall not eat anything leavened in all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread Here's what you have to grasp about this. 
all of the feasts that God established in the Old Testament were teaching tools. They were to show us how we are to relate to him. And they were basically foreshadowings of the New Testament way to relate to him. We're going to talk about that, how Jesus is a new and living way. But the Old Testament sacrificial system and the feasts were to try to get us to understand what God was going to do through Jesus. So this is why it's important to understand that the blood... The sacrifice of a lamb at Passover and the unleavened bread can't be separated. They were the same celebration. So you needed blood. Why? Because at Passover, what they did to escape the angel of death who was coming to bring judgment on Egypt, they would sacrifice that lamb and they would take the blood of that lamb and they would paint it over the doors of their houses and on the sides of the doors. And that basically left a sign saying, the people in here are God's people. And they've done this blood sacrifice to be covered by that lamb's blood against the coming plague. You understand that? Okay. And so that, that particular observance was a foreshadowing of the fact that if we're going to escape the consequences of sin, we've got to get under the blood of Jesus. We've got to get under his covering. We've got to have it painted over our lives. That's what that was going to teach us. That's why in Hebrews 9.22 it says, According to the law, one may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. God was teaching that to them back in the uh, Passover, and so that they would understand that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And so... It says in Hebrews 12, then, uh, uh, excuse me, 10, 11, and 12, every priest stands ministering daily and offering uh, time after time the same sacrifice which can never take away sins, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. So that's why when Jesus died, being the ultimate Lamb of God, there was no need to sacrifice animals anymore. Amen. There's no need to go into the temple and bring a lamb or a bull or whatever. Those were just practice. Those were just a lesson to get it into our heads. Do you understand that when you've sinned, you've got to be covered? And after years and years and years of that lesson, God said, okay, now the real thing's going to happen. My son's going to die. He's the lamb. And that's it. Amen. Don't need priests to come in time after time after time offering more sacrifices. You had your final sacrifice. Get under his blood. Amen. It says this, continue on then in verses 19 to 22, Hebrews 10. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and a full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What's the first word in verse 19? Therefore. Therefore. Okay? That word is there for a reason because it's trying to tell us. It's saying that, listen, because we are now covered by the blood, we should approach God in a certain way. This is a new and living way. It's not with uh, animal sacrifices. It's with the sacrifice of God's Son. So, so we're learning this. Therefore, because we've said, I want to be covered by that blood. I want to be a Christian. I want to be forgiven of my sins. Therefore, if that's true, we should be able to approach God with a sincere heart full assurance of our faith, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. What is this saying? It's saying there's, there's a connection between my saying I want to be covered by his blood and how I choose to live under that covering. The connection is this. I can't say, I want you to cover my sins, Jesus, but I want to keep on doing them. That's why the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover happened together, because leaven represents sin. And the people of Israel were told, listen, paint the door with blood and get the sin out. 
Amen. Don't paint the door with blood and say, hey, God, pass over our house, but we're going to be in here sinning, okay? No, not okay. Get all the leaven out. Amen. Understand that you're asking to be covered. You don't take that lightly. You don't get covered so you can just keep on sinning. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? This is why you hear people use the term cheap grace. You know, grace is free, but it wasn't cheap. Right. It cost Jesus everything. So anytime we say, you know, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway because, well, it's already covered by the blood. Wow. You know what that's called? The leaven of the Pharisees. Right. I'm already forgiven so I can keep on sinning. It's hypocrisy. And so what Jesus is teaching us here is that, that our lives should be free of that yeast, free of that sin, if we really, truly are saying, I'm walking under the banner of his forgiveness. If I'm not doing both parts of the feast, Jesus, cover with, with your blood, and I'm getting this yeast out of my life because you deserve better than that. See, that's why Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. He says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I think that's great. I'm a new lump. <laughs> See, I don't mind being a lump. That's okay. But, but, but I, I'm supposed to be a certain kind of lump. I'm supposed to be a sincere and true and, and, and a lump that appreciates what Jesus did for me, not a lump that has yeast in it that's continuing to sin and acting like, well, what's the big deal? He already died for it. Who cares if I do it? It's not how we're supposed to walk. Here's a song called My Jesus. Paul, can you get this on? I think it's on the synth. Uh... Thanks. Here on the bank I stand But in the water is the hope of man Unclean I fall before you now Jesus come and wash me inside out I'm running to the water now I'm running to the water now and I'm lost in your love and your mercy. Lord, your beauty is so overwhelming. I'm thankful for your truth. I'm so in love with you, my Jesus, my Jesus. All things are new again. Covered in waters of love I stand All my chains are broken All things are new again Covered in waters of love I stand All my chains are broken Cause I'm washed inside your ocean And I'm running the water now I'm running to the water now and I'm lost in your love and your mercy Lord your beauty is so overwhelming 
me. I'm thankful for your truth. I'm so in love with you, my Jesus, my Jesus. And I'm lost in your love and your mercy. Lord, your beauty is so overwhelming. I'm thankful for your truth. I'm so in love with you, my Jesus, my Jesus, my Jesus. Father, we just come before you today and we just thank you for the beauty of what Jesus did for us. But we also thank you for revelation from your word that there's two parts to this equation that was represented in Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's what Jesus was warning us about. Cover yourselves with my blood, but get the yeast out of your lives. I need pure vessels. I made you a new lump, and that lump wasn't to be infected with that yeast of hypocrisy, proclaiming that I'm a Christian, but acting like I'm not. Lord, we just ask you that we could be walking as a lump of sincerity and truth, that our actions would match what we proclaim to be, that it will be obvious that we are not only covered by the blood, but we've rejected the yeast, and we're walking in the fullness of what you've called us to. And we thank you for this today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.